Hey, this is Ron Deal. Just real quick before we jump into the podcast, I just wanted to let you know that some of the things you're going to hear regarding Blended and Blessed uh, may be a little bit outdated. We recorded this podcast some time ago, and obviously the coronavirus has changed some things for all of us. But the good news is Blended and Blessed will go on. Those of you in the Houston area that were planning to join us and be part of the live audience, you can be converted to a live stream audience and you could still participate in this event. You know, it occurs to me that this is an opportunity for all of us. Tell a friend about Blended and Blessed. Everybody's kind of cooped up in their homes right now and they need some encouragement, maybe something that's going to offer them some hope and some energy for their family. And this could very well be it. So Blended and Blessed, Saturday, April 25th. We hope that you'll join us as a part of our live stream audience, safe and secure from your home. To stay up to date with the latest details, go to blendedandblessed.com and be sure to follow us on Facebook at Family Life Blended or on Instagram at Family Life Blended. Now, on with the podcast. Even coming, to be real honest, even coming into this interview and chat with you today, I've found that it just in a few moments, I've had to just stop and say, just pick up the story. Don't pick up the shame. If I don't believe that God has forgiven me in this, I don't believe he forgives. From the Family Life Podcast Network, this is Family Life Blended. I'm Ron Deal. This podcast brings together timeless wisdom and practical help and hope to blended families and those who love them. Before we jump in, you may know that my newest book, Building Love Together in Blended Families, co-authored with New York Times bestselling author Dr. Gary Chapman, is now available. And Gary will be joining me on stage for Family Life's one-day live stream event for blended family couples called Blended and Blessed. It's on Saturday, April 25th. You can go online and you can register and watch on your smartphone, your laptop. You can learn all about it at blendedandblessed.com. By the way, if this is your first podcast by chance, we have dozens more on a variety of blended family topics. I'm thinking, for example, of episode number nine, my conversation about step parenting with author Gayla Grace, or number 14 called In Their Shoes with Lauren Reitzema. That's our conversation about what it's like to be step-parented from the kid's point of view. You can subscribe right now to get all our previous podcasts and future ones, or you can listen online and at the same time get access to articles and online videos and conference information. Do all that at familylife.com slash podcasts. By the way, if you'd like to follow us on social media, that's a great way to get daily tips and tools. You can do that at Family Life Blended on Facebook and Instagram. You know, if we're honest, I think we all feel unworthy sometimes. Unworthy of being loved, unworthy of finding happiness, unworthy of God's grace and experiencing his blessing on our life. That is familiar territory to my guests on this episode of Family Life Blended, and what they share about their journey is inspiration for all of us. Sandy Patty and Don Peslis have been married for almost 20 years and have a blended family of eight children. As one of the most highly acclaimed performers of our time, with five Grammy Awards, four Billboard Music Awards, three platinum records, five gold records, and 11 million units sold, Sandy Patty is simply known as The Voice. With 40 Dove Awards, Sandy is the most awarded female vocalist in contemporary gospel music history and is a member of the Gospel Music Hall of Fame. In addition to her musical career, she's the author of eight books, including her autobiography, simply called The Voice. Her book about her journey in a blended family is entitled Life in the Blender. Sandy's husband, Don Peslis, serves at Crossings Community Church in Oklahoma City as a pastor of chapel worship. He's actively involved in community outreach programs. Here's my conversation with Sandy Patty and Don Peslis. Don, Sandy, you know, this isn't true for everyone in a blended family by any means, but sometimes 
folks in a blended family, their family came about because of less than ideal circumstances. Sometimes it was an unhealthy or unwise choice. Sometimes it was a sinful choice. But we believe and we know that there is hope in Christ, there is forgiveness in Christ, and like all sin, there is redemption beyond our worst moments. Now, having said that, you guys got started off on the wrong foot. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, We've often said, you know, blended families are all born out of loss whether it's um, the death of a spouse in remarriage or death of a marriage and a remarriage, but it's always born out of loss. For our situation, it was also born out of brokenness. We have reasons, but there's no blame that lays with anyone but the two of us. And as we were traveling on the road together and just developed a friendship, that friendship became much more than it should be with outside of marriage. And there was so much that I loved watching Don with kids. And he just loved on my kids as we traveled. And there was just so much respect. And I didn't understand boundaries like I do now. And we just found ourselves in a situation that we just never thought we would find ourselves in. And as our marriages, other marriages were ending, we, uh, just kind of overlap the process. And uh, I don't smirk at that mm. lightly. I'm just, it's, these are hard words to say yeah. for both of us. But I think that Don and I want to share pieces of our story that can encourage, not excuse other people or give them an easy out, but to encourage them that in their brokenness, they're not alone. And there are people who've walked ahead of them and can offer some words of advice. And if yeah. you know, a friend of mine once said, if you're going to make a mistake, at least make a new one. <laughs> <laughs> learn yeah. from ours. Learn you know? from, yeah, learn from other people. So mm-hmm. for our listener that's just not familiar with your story, although it's it was it's public in some ways, and Sandy, you've written about this in a couple of books that are available for people to pick up. You were both married at the time that your relationship started. And that was part of, I don't know the whole picture, but certainly there was a relationship that formed when it shouldn't have and that contributed to, tell me if that's not fair, it contributed to the ending of those previous relationships. And then that's the beginning of how your blended family came to be. And so even now, Sandy, you were telling me 25 years you guys have been married. Um, 25. Yeah, it's still difficult talking about that season of your life. Don, is it is it still hard for you? It is hard because it's always hard when the kids were little, we talked about when you mess up, fess up. Ah. So <laughs> that's a great thing. And it's so hard because the enemy wants us when we mess up to keep us away from yeah. redemption. And you know, really the Lord is saying, hey, come here and let's, he's the author of making things and taking broken relationships and broken things and making something beautiful come out of that. But absolutely, Ron, we could have, you know, hindsight, I don't know, I wish I had said it, but hindsight's always 20-20. And it's really great when things can have a proper ending and then new things can have a proper beginning, but sometimes it doesn't work out that way. So absolutely, as we look back, and if couples out there listening find themselves in this, as we did, you know, the last thing we want you to do is, is stay away from the church or the Lord because he wants us to to bring ourselves and our process, and he can help sift through uh, with love all of that. And that's really at the heart if we could, you know, Ron, our story. You know, unlike Joseph, I liken my uh, my pitfalls. I made a lot of the, the mistakes that we made, unlike things happening to Joseph. But I look back on Joseph's story, and it's so God was with us every step of the way, and he never pulled back his unfailing love from us. Never and wooed us, if you will, the Lord, to to figure it out, to sift it out, and so yes, it is difficult. But yet, Ron, it's not because to say God wasn't there in the midst that He was there and redeeming, even through the roughest of times. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense, and really, that is so important for people to remember. You know, one of the things I really appreciate about you guys and your willingness to talk about this is because 
I often find, well, everybody who's honest <laughs> looks in the rearview mirror and says, man, I have blown it so many times. There, there is so many sins. I could see the consequences. Mm. And sometimes the ripples just keep going from the, from the sin and the choices that we've made in the past. If we're honest and if we're humble before God, which is always the posture that we should have, not just when we come in faith, but to walk in faith every single day, mm-hmm. we have to own that about ourselves. Mm-hmm. And... The point is, in owning that, we also submit ourselves to the redemptive work of Jesus. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And yet, we can hold shame over ourselves. We can beat ourselves up. We can live in a place where we cannot celebrate who we are today in Christ. And I think that's really unfortunate. I love that we're talking about you guys 25 years later, faithful, loving, committed to one another, uh, moving forward, both deeply involved in ministry in the circles God has put you. Your children are involved in ministry. All kinds of things are happening with them now as adults. And you can hold your head up. Yes. I'm going to say yes, question mark. Because it's... it's, um, it's so easy to pull that shame um, back out from the foot of the cross. Hmm. How do we pull the story that can encourage without pulling the shame that keeps us down? There are just things that, you know, I wish I, we, we both wish and and not just in this situation, but other, I wish I could have said something differently just this week um, to one of my kids. I just, I said something that was not meant at all to be insensitive. And yet the minute I said it, it was like, you know, I, I wish I could take that back. I can't take that back. All I can do, and I think this is what Don and I have really tried to do, is when God really finally got our attention and and kind of said, we need to take care of some stuff first if we're even going to move on. Mm. And that was to walk through, along with our church body in Indiana, mm-hmm. a biblical steps of, of restoration. The recognition, you first, you have to, you just have to own it. You just go, yes, I recognize. And then... You have to repent. And that doesn't mean just saying, I'm sorry. It means changing, turn turn around. Mm. Then there's restitution. And I think a lot of times we forget about restitution. Going to people, saying the words that you've got to say. And we, you know, had quite a list of people that separately and individually together we, we went to. And then reconnecting, reconnecting with a group of people who are going to hold you accountable, who are going to walk with you. Walking with someone doesn't always mean you agree with everything they've done. It means you're going to stand with them. You're going to encourage them to just do the next right thing. And then the number, the fifth one is restoration closure. That's the hard one for me because there does come a time when you've done all that to leave it at the foot of the cross. And I think that's what I was talking about. It's when, when do we pick that story up without picking the shame up? Sometimes that's a very deliberate picture image in my mind, especially when I'm tired or I've been on the road or those get really sticky together. And just even coming, to be real honest, even coming into this interview and chat with you today, I've found that it just in a few moments, I've had to just stop and say, just pick up the story. Don't pick up the shame. If I don't believe that God has forgiven me in this, I don't believe he forgives. So it's just, it's as simple as that. That doesn't mean it's easy. You know, and then especially when, you know, I just had this really stupid thing of mine happen with one of the kids. It's just so easy to just grab that shame and just throw it all over me. And so 
you know, even as we're talking now, I'm just kind of, I'm reminding myself of some of those good redemptive things. Mm -hmm. To be real honest. (laughs) Well, and you know, it's not only us putting on the shame. I was in full-time ministry at the time and really took a time from 92 to 2012 till my current senior pastor, Marty Grubbs, and I sat down. I was on the 35th floor of the Petroleum Club. I had come to Oklahoma City for an entirely different uh, vocation, but God was a part of all of that process, that redemptive 20 years, really. And I likened it to putting on a letter jacket with a big A on it. And the enemy, the enemy stood there every day saying, here's your letter jacket as you're getting ready to go to work. Now let's put our jacket on our jacket of shame, Mm -hmm. okay, because he can keep us down. Yes. If we don't tell our story, if we don't share with others, that's the only place God's redemptive, miraculous grace can be seen. So if the enemy, do the math, if the enemy keeps us from sharing and keeps us from talking and keeps us with the jacket of shame on, nobody hears currently about all of us that are broken, what God has done for all of us to redeem us. So it took Marty Grubbs to say to me in 2012, hey, Don, why don't you stop putting on that jacket? And we all, we grade sin. You know, we'll say, well, that's an A plus sin. Oh, well, that's a B (laughs) minus. We're going to give him a C plus on that. (laughs) Any missing of the mark is a missing of the mark. And if the enemy can keep us, I'm not minimizing here, but I'm saying the light is better. The light is good. Let's walk in the light as he is in the light. That's right. And then the blood of Christ can cleanse us, you see. At the end of the day, what you're talking about is what everybody listening has to do day in and day out about whatever our sin narrative is. Every one of us, Ron. Whether it was one of the A-plus sins or a (laughs) C-minus sin. Right, exactly. I mean, a major prophets, minor prophets. Yes. Now, (laughs) Now, sometimes the shaking the shame... Shaking the consequences of our sin. Oh, but there are always consequences, Ron. Exactly. That's exactly right. Exactly. Always. But shaking the shame depends on whether it was an A-plus or a C-minus sin. It does. Mm -hmm. You know, different things carry a different amount of baggage That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I I am just sitting here, uh, you know, so grateful that you're doing what you're doing, even as we're talking. I I just have to say... (laughs) The secular world of neuroscience in the last 10 years has studied shame a lot. And what all the experts have come down to is exactly what you guys have just said and demonstrated for us right now. They talk about you tell your story, right? You guys said you have to recognize and you have to take responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. You have to verbally tell the narrative. That's called confession. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You have to recognize what's there and the pain that it brings you. You can't run away from it. You got to own it. You got to you got to deal with it. You got to repent. You got to change your heart. You got to make restitution. You got to reconnect to a community. Community is so important to helping alleviate shame when others are coming along and affirming us like your pastor saying take off your coat. It's time you can do this. It's all right. We're with mm-hmm. you. You're mm-hmm. worthwhile. Mm-hmm. You're valuable. Mm-hmm. All of that stuff is so important. And then one of the biggest pieces they talk about is just practicing putting down the shame. Yeah. And I yeah. just watched Sandy <laughs> do that. She just said I have to remind myself even now That's that right. I can leave it there and it's not mine to pick up. So everything God has told us is exactly what we need to do to wrestle with what we feel is left over from the past. Well, and, and Ron, one thing I would add as you, were, as you were recounting that is to have the courage to go back, get this, and face the pain that brought us into the situation mm-hmm. in the first place. Mm-hmm. Because yes. there's pain, the brokenness before is what brought us into that, both mm-hmm. of us. Yeah. Sandy yeah. alluded to it, boundaries. I w- I'm adopted uh, from adoption and have dealt with abandonment my whole life. So the brokenness prior, that you've got to go back. Uh, it, not to be, I don't mean to be depressing to our listeners out there, that there's always work to do, but you got to go back to those some of those things that you brought into it with, and that even makes things even more crystal clear, if you will. But it takes courage to go back even before that. Yeah, you it know? does indeed. And when Paul says putting the past behind and looking towards Mm -hmm. what is ahead, Mm -hmm. I really think that he's not meaning just forget it, minimize it, bury it, 
because we bury it alive if we do that. <laughs> but to put it in its proper place, understand it, and we can give you a lot of reasons. I can give you a lot of reasons that I was not able to make healthy, good choices. There's still not excuses. Mm-hmm. And no, no. we have to understand, though, why so we don't do them again, mm-hmm. putting our past behind so we can move ahead. You know, I had a thought a minute ago as you were talking. I think regret is different than feeling like God can't love you. But sometimes those get confusing to us. Like we can have regrets over something we did, something we said in the past. It's different when we say that mistake makes it impossible for God to love us. Yeah. My uh, my dear friend, Sheila Walsh, she says something really powerful, and it's about guilt and shame. She says, guilt tells us we've done something wrong. Mm-hmm. Shame says we are the something wrong. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of what you're saying, mm-hmm. Ron, is, is there's normal conviction of the Holy Spirit of, you know, that uneasiness when we know we've hurt someone that we've just got to have a conversation. And then there's that, I am just unworthy to even be in the conversation about what it means to be loved. Right. And that's what we put on ourselves. That's the enemy talking to us, where we're now doubting God's ability to love in spite of us. We're now doubting God's ability to forgive based on our past, and we're listening more to uh, what others are saying and what the enemy is saying to us than we're listening to what God has promised to do. And it is so easy to do that. I mean, I I think every one of us can relate to that, especially people who are trying to walk in the light. Like, you really are wanting to do what's right. But the minute you cross that line into, I'm now unworthy, I'm unforgivable— We've we've lost sight, really, of Christ's sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, Somebody asks, I get asked a lot in interviews, what would make my life richer? And it's always the same answer. That I really, really believe when God's Word says, I love you with an everlasting love, Hmm. that He just means that, Hmm. period. Hmm. Like, if I really woke up every day, how would I live my day out Mm -hmm. differently Mm -hmm. if I really believed he was not going to stop loving me? Yeah, yeah. I think I'm closer to that than I used to be, but I'm still not there. Mm -hmm. You know, that's good, Sam. And furthermore, it's A. And B is we are the plan A to give that love, to live that Mm -hmm. love, to model that love to take that depth of unending, everlasting love and pass it on Hmm. to those around us. How would I live? If I believed that and I knew that love was the plan A to change this planet, how would I live different? So that's a good thought. So let me ask another question. Let's kind of turn the corner a little bit. So it's, yeah, wrestling with your shame, practice putting it away, setting it down, saying, you know what? I don't have to pick that up. You know, or don't Christ, put it on. I don't have to put it on. Christ has done that for me. The work is done. All I have to do is just trust in that and and move forward. And yet, I think what God wants to do in us is full redemption, if I could use that term. Redemption is, okay, I'm forgiven. Full redemption is, I can now feel good about my life. I can now celebrate the blessings he's given me. And when there's a grace on my life today, even though on some level I feel like I don't deserve it, Mm -hmm. I can enjoy the moment. You guys have been married for 25 years. There's good stuff because of those 25 years. Kids have had blessings. There's good stuff because of those 25 years. Talk to me about receiving that full redemption and resting in, it's okay, and we can even celebrate what God is doing with us. We came out to Oklahoma City from Indiana about 10 years ago. Like Don was saying, it was for a whole different reason why we came out here, but we ended up 
at our church. Don ended up on staff. And now that I'm kind of semi-retired, I'm also on staff. So he's one of the pastors and I get to be artist in residence. Mm. And I think there's, at least in me, and I think sometimes in Don, although he's much more of a optimist, I say, I'm not a pessimist, so I'm a realist. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I still marvel in a very, very grateful way that we are able to serve together in a church family that takes us just like we are Mm -hmm. and wants just like we are. Mm -hmm. And our scars and the healing of those seem to be much more important to them than looking closely to see if we have any or not. Does that make sense? Yes. And to just feel genuinely loved and accepted within these sanctuary walls as an allegory, but obviously there's a sanctuary involved, just continues to fill my heart with unbelievable gratitude and that we actually get to serve together. It's pretty great. And I don't know that that would have happened. I don't know. I don't know if it would have or not. I can't say, but it has happened out here. Mm-hmm. And for that, mm-hmm. we are grateful. It does mm-hmm. speak to the power of community and how important that is in our lives. And unfortunately, one of the things shame makes us do is pull back and withdraw from the place where others could speak into our hearts and mm-hmm. reaffirm and remind us who we really are in Christ, not who we you know, fear that we have become. I wrote down two words as you were talking, grateful and you marvel. at. Yeah, gratitude is a part of receiving the gift. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's a part of walking in that understanding and resting in it. And marvel, I thought, was a great word just because it represents, yeah, this is this is how big Christ's work in my life is. Well, you mentioned something, and it, it took me to a K-Love uh, song I listen to every morning as I'm getting ready just to K-Love. It's just one of my routines. Mm. Waking up to a new sunrise, looking back from the other side, I can see now with open eyes, darkest water and deepest pain. I wouldn't trade it for anything because my brokenness brought me to you. And these wounds are a story you'll use. So I'm thankful for the scars Hmm. because without them, I wouldn't know your heart. And I know they'll always tell of who you are. So forever, I'm thankful for the scars. It's Hmm. a song popular, I Am They, uh, it's current. Mm -hmm. Now I'm standing in confidence with the strength of your faithfulness, and I'm not who I was before. No, I don't have to fear anymore. So I'm thankful for the scars, because without them, I wouldn't know your heart. And I know they'll always tell of who you are, so forever, I'm thankful for the scars. And this 10-year decade in Oklahoma City has really been a chance for Sandy and I, even though you'd say we were 15 years into the marriage, to go to a new level of shared ministry and partnership together. And that's been one of the surprises. Now I'm looking back at a decade. Yes, I'm doing something totally different than what brought us out here. Yes, we're empty nesters. You take, what else did we learn in this decade? But we really found Don and Sandy mm-hmm. and I, in a whole new, deeper way. And that's something that just, mm. I think, Ron, for those folks listening that are in a blended relationship beginning or in the middle, or it just takes some time to sort out And, you know, cream, it kind of rises to the top. Hmm. You know, there's no other way around it or under it. You just have to kind of move through it together. Does that make sense? Oh, wow. It really does make sense. And you got to trust the process in the journey. Absolutely. Uh, You know, you just shared that song. It it brought a thought to my mind. One last question about all this, and I want to talk some about your kids and some of the other things (laughs) that are going on now at this season of your life. So you're both in music, right? So you guys have spent a lot of time singing, sometimes performing, uh, leading worship. I had an experience that I will never forget. I was at a church. I was guest speaking over the weekend, and 
It was one of those churches. They had three services on Sunday morning, and after the second worship service, the same worship team had been leading. They've now heard my sermon twice. I've heard them twice. I'm having small talk with one of the worship leaders in between worship number two and going into number three, and turns out she's in a blended family. And uh, we started talking around that a little bit, and and I started saying, yeah, well, that's that's pretty neat. And, and she was like, well, yeah. She was backpedaling, backpedaling, backpedaling. And I, so I started asking, well, tell me what that's about. And the story came out. She didn't feel good about some of the decisions she made early in her life and in her first marriage. And uh, that led to a divorce. And now she's married to husband number two. And she still doesn't quite feel like they can celebrate their usness. When I pressed a little bit, it came down to this matter of shame. And I was struck that this woman who was so amazing to lead all of us with songs of grace into the throne room of God to sing about it, didn't believe it herself. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what songs you sing or lead Mm -hmm. that you have a hard time believing. Uh, For me, and then I want to, I want to follow up with something that I did with each of my kids out of that very heart that you're talking about the, Mm -hmm. one of the worship leaders. I always gravitate to the songs that say, I am chosen, not forsaken. I Mm. am who you say I am. Mm. Mm. Sometimes I will sing those lyrics out of inspiration because I can readily recall how they have been true in my life. More than often than not, I sing out of aspiration because I want them to be true in my life. The point being, those are true. It's true. Whether on any particular day I feel it or not, I can proclaim that it is true. Mm -hmm. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Those kinds of songs, I just want to proclaim them. And again, sometimes it's inspiration, sometimes it's aspiration, but it's still true. But it's a very interesting, and maybe this will speak to some blended families that are listening. And I so get your story and the lady sharing with you, because for a long time, I wouldn't pat Don on the arm or give him a little kiss in front of the kids, Mm -hmm. because I never wanted the kids to think that us celebrating our marriage, that I've forgotten what it cost them. Mm -hmm. And as the kids began to get older and the kids began to get out of the house, I started hearing stories of some of my friends who's, you know, were empty nesters and they just really lost touch with their spouse and, you know, those things that can happen. And I thought, you know what, I don't want that to be us because while The blended family story is very real. This is my husband. Mm -hmm, Right. And if I don't celebrate him, somebody's going to. (laughs) And I wanted that. I mean, that had to be me. And I think you know there's a lot more pitfalls when you've walked through them. And so I tried to, I think, God, what is the next right thing for me to do here? So it just really came to my heart that I wanted to speak to each and every one of my kids in person with no time constraint and face-to-face and say to them kind of what I just said to you. It's a new season for us, and I want to celebrate my marriage. I want my husband to feel that his wife celebrates him. Mm. But I don't ever for one second want you to think that that is because we've forgotten what it has cost you. That is always there in our minds, always. But in this new season, I just want you to know, and I just want your blessing on that. So it took me about a year to get around to each of the kids where I had that private moment. I just asked God to provide the opportunity. There were different reactions. There were, we know that. There were, we appreciate you saying that. There was, mom, if you don't move on, how do you expect us to? Mm. 
So it really honestly provided not only a necessary point in time for me in our marriage, but it also provided good conversation with the kids. And it's a very hard thing to do. But that was one of those tangible steps, like laying it at the foot of the cross of saying, okay, how do we celebrate this? Well, you know what? You address, you just say, there's an elephant in the room. I'm just going to say there is, and let's just talk about it. And so maybe that can be a, an encouragement to someone, you know, like the gal you mentioned and anybody else that's listening. Absolutely. I, I think the very powerful takeaway there is if you are maybe singing songs of grace with aspiration, you want mm-hmm. it to be true, you start acting as if it's true. What would I do? I would celebrate my husband. I, mm-hmm. No, I need, to, I need to clear the air with the kids and right. I need to let's go ahead and talk this through and talk about the elephant. Mm-hmm. But that's going to help us move toward a place where we can start acting as if we are chosen, not forsaken. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> that, that's, Definitely. That is great. It took you a year. You got a lot of kids? <laughs> a, yep, quite a few. <laughs> some are introverts, some are extroverts. So yeah. Tell us about your kids. Go ahead, Don. They were ages when we blended, began the blending was... Uh, 11, 7, 7, 7, 6, 5, and 3. <laughs> 7, and 7, we, 7. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I had twins. <laughs> and I, my oldest, Donnie, was, so it was like triplets. Mm, wow. And then six mm-hmm. months in, six months into the, the blended uh, life in the blender, if you will, we adopted Sam. Mm-hmm. Sam found us. So we added a brand new four-day-old baby six months into the mix. And today, what are their ages? 35 down to 23. Wow, mm-hmm. man. And we have four grandkids. Hmm. See, that's, yep. that's the grace that comes out of the walking this thing out. Yeah. Yeah. And we had a, a medical situation come up a couple of weeks ago, and everything's fine. Hmm, good. But it allowed the kids to say some really sweet things to us that it was like, well, we go ahead. You felt that way. Well, please, <laughs> please share. You can brag. I'm giving you permission. <laughs> yeah. I, well, it, Don had a, you know, little test. We had a little cancer scare, mm. and everything is fine. Mm-hmm. As we kind of just tried to casually, kind of share the information with the kids. It was very sweet their in deeply emotional reaction. Hmm. Hmm. It's like, well, wow, well, we had no idea. You sometimes feel as parents, you only hear how you don't get it right. Yeah, yeah. And we make that up a lot in our head. But it was just one of those opportunities that allowed the kids to really deeply express whether it was his biological kids or whether it was my kids to say, Look, you're the dad of this family. Um, that was just. Sweet. I, I'm not going to interrupt you, but 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 I guess I am to say we've never, Ron, <laughs> put down our our previous spouses mm-hmm. in front of the kids. You know, you you try to do things early on, and there are bullet points we can walk through as some things. But I think that's one of those reasons we did that. We honored as much as and I and not only going to the kids, but we went to. You know, I went to John, I went to my former wife, Michelle. So we went, Sandy did the same thing. So you, you know, in that restitution, going and talking and and uh, seeking forgiveness, I think because we handled those things as best as we could and as, as well as we could, this was another marker 25 years out to say, yeah, I'm, I'm an extra dad to her kids, but I'm, you know, it's pretty special. And Sandy's an extra mom to my kids, but buddy, it's pretty special. Yeah. You know, and I felt like I always knew in my heart of hearts, Ron, that these kids would love each other. And if you ask me the proof, you mm-hmm. say, Don, okay, what's the proof in the pudding? <laughs> the proof in the pudding is that these kids, this Ganisola Pivy, this bunch of, uh, <laughs> a bunch of a broken mess, they love each other and they love being together and they're a family unit. And they they love each other, and that to me is the sign. Hmm. That the, there's the secret sauce. 
Yeah. And we've often said we are going to have the job long before we have the title. Hmm, yes. And I think that sometimes in blended families, we want the title so bad. We yeah. want, you need to call me mom. You need to call me dad. Yeah, they got to let that go. We ask the kids, you call us whatever you want. We don't care. Yeah. And so we do, we do tell people, you're going to have the job long before you have the title. Well, that's what we recommend here at Family Life Blended, that you let the kids pick something, as long as it's respectful. We do have yeah. that little caveat. Most days. <laughs> Most days. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. But no, that's wise because you're respecting where they are and their boundaries. And love has to be something we choose. It can't be something mm-hmm. that's forced exactly. on us. But I love the rewards that you're talking about. That's the other thing we talk a lot about around here is hold on for the rewards. They don't come immediately for most families. You, you get little rewards, but the mm-hmm. bigger rewards come as a result of the longer journey. And in your case, you guys are tasting some of that at the 25-year mark. And I, and I regret that a medical situation kind of was what forced it to the surface, but boy, is it nice when you got it, I can tell the smiles on your faces as I talk to you. I know how sweet that was. Even when we moved to Oklahoma 10 years ago, thinking the kids are out of the house, they're in college, you know, where we move isn't going to matter. It's like, they're like, wait, you left us. It's like, <laughs> you know, I didn't, we didn't even know you cared. I mean, I, I don't, I don't yeah. you know what I mean? It's uh-huh. just when moments like that come, it is, it is very sweet to be reminded. Yeah. That's sure great. Is. You know, yeah. I'm going to go back to something that, Sandy, you said towards the beginning of our conversation. You were just alluding to sometimes first marriages don't come to a proper ending. You know, it occurs to me that even if it doesn't come to a proper ending, quote unquote, and you find yourself now living in a situation as a result of unwise, poor, or sinful choices, you could still bring about a proper ending. I've, I've worked with people where we created a little ritual where they went back and said, you know, I, I need to finish well. Even though we are long past the way it should have been, I'm still going to implement something that should yeah. have happened back then. When you guys went to your former spouses and talked about those moments of the past and the regrets that you have, you know, had those conversations, I think that was a proper ending. You were facilitating yes. something there. You may be listening to us right now and go, yeah, but Ron, you don't know what I did. Well, you know what? Maybe it's time for a funeral. A funeral of who you were. Yes. A funeral of who you were, dead to that person and now alive in Christ. Mm -hmm. And hold on. Now your trust is in him, not in who you are or who you were. But it's that person's gone. Maybe Because that is the language of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. The old is gone. The new Mm -hmm. is here. You know, and... And again, I think at the end of the day, it comes down, do I rest in that? Can I rest in that? You cannot change your past, but you can change the story you tell about your past. Mm -hmm. And the new story is one of God's work of redemption in your life. Let me invite you guys. um, If you had a closing thought, if you you were sitting down with somebody and and you're, you're looking at somebody who's living right now what you were living 25 years ago, what would you tell him? You've been listening to my conversation with Sandy Patty and Don Peslis. I'm Ron Deal, and this is Family Life Blended. We'll hear Don and Sandy's response to that question in just a minute. Real quick, do me a favor, review this podcast, maybe leave a comment. This helps others find the podcast and find help and hope. And it encourages our team here at Family Life. One person took the time to write this. The Smart Step Family book was recommended to us by a premarital counselor, and I just recently discovered this podcast. I listen on my commute to and from work, and it has helped in incredible ways. The Lord is changing my heart through this podcast. I also learned about The Weekend to Remember and signed up. If you are in a blended family, whether it's going good or bad, you need this podcast in your life. It's encouraged me to want to start a step family ministry at our church, and I'm excited to see what the Lord does with our story. There are not many resources out there for step families, and I was beginning to feel defeated. So thank you for all you do for our community. Your wisdom is priceless. Wow. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share that with us.
Well, if you like those resources, I think you're going to love my newest book with Dr. Gary Chapman called Building Love Together in Blended Families. By the way, it's out and available wherever books are sold, and it's the theme of our upcoming event, Blended and Blessed. That's a live stream event on Saturday, April 25th, 2020. That's just a couple weeks away, and it's not too late to register. Just go to blendedandblessed.com. You know, if you're in a similar situation to Don and Sandy and you're struggling with the past, I want to encourage you to find a church and a pastor that will walk you through a repentance and healing process, kind of like what they went through. Now, I, I wish this next statement weren't true, but it is. Not every church is equipped to help with things like this. You may have to look around a little bit. But I think finding a supportive community is very important for blended family couples. Now, let me speak to leaders who are listening right now. We can be pretty good at church, at calling people out for sinful behavior, but we're not so good at getting down into the trenches with them post-sin and helping them find grace. Let me encourage you to strive to be a church that walks beside people in love and calls them to recognize and admit their fault, their sin, to repent from it, and then to move into restoration with God and those they've hurt, and then celebrate that with them. As a church, Don's pastor essentially said, hey, take off that coat of shame and get back into ministry where you belong. That's celebrating God's redemptive work in people's lives. I've talked with so many people through the years, even ministers through the years, who who lost their ministry because of a divorce, and they thought they'd never be used by God ever again, only to discover that they could be in doing blended family ministry in their church. I must say, seeing somebody restored into ministry again, into their calling, is a real personal joy of mine. But my point is this. Churches should look for ways to restore people in due time back into ministry, whatever that looks like for them. Make sure they go through a good repentance process, but when the time comes, restore them back into ministry. Some of the most passionate and effective leaders are those who have tasted just how sweet God's grace is. Their gratitude and their humility is magnetic. We should try to steward that, steward God's work in their lives, and restore them if we can. Well, if you'd like more information about our guests, you can find it at sandypatty.com or just go to our show notes. You can also check it out on the Family Life Blended podcast page. That's at familylife.com slash podcasts. And while you're there, you might check out everything else Family Life has for your marriage and family. We're an international organization providing practical, biblical help and hope for all kinds of relationship situations. Check us out, familylife.com. Please remember to subscribe to this podcast if you haven't done so already. You can do so at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Just search Family Life Blended with Ron Deal. And remember again to look at those show notes for additional links to more resources that can be helpful for you. And if you like what you hear, maybe you'll do us a favor and mention this on social media or share this podcast in one way or another. Again, that's really helpful. People trust you, and you can help them find some trusted resources. Now, before we're done, I had one more question for Don and Sandy. If you were sitting down with somebody and and you're, you're looking at somebody who's living right now what you were living 25 years ago, what would you tell them? I would tell them maybe two things. I would say take care and nurture your spouse relationship. Mm. And then I think the second thing is I would say, and just be patient with the process. Mm. Mm. I could add a lot more words to that, but that's pretty much it. What would you say, babe? Well, I think it's wise to find the right time and in the right time and when it makes sense to go and make as many things right as you can, to be honest. I I think I would say, don't stay away from the church. You know, the enemy, we believe those uh, voices and we stay away from the church and the shame and the guilt. And I think the church, she's better at walking along with us now, 25 years in the, Mm. we're much better at uh, being honest 
that we're all kind of broken. <laughs> and, uh-huh. Yes. And there's room at the table for the broken. So come along and don't be afraid to journey in the church and not uh, that's another lie of the enemy is get your life worked out, then come on into church. No, you got to kind of work it out together. And there are folks like us that have made some pretty big doozy mistakes in front of you that you can learn from us and learn from our mistakes. But I think that I think the Holy Spirit and there's good counselors and there's good wisdom in the church today to say, yes, you're welcome. You're welcome. Come in here and let's walk with you. So I think that's that's one thing I, I would say for sure uh, to add to that is is don't stay away. Come and walk walk within the doors of the church. She's still the best option for us. Well, let me just say I'm encouraged by your story and the way you guys have been patient with your process and the way you have walked it out in the context of the church and community and other believers. And you've submitted yourself to a process and full redemption is yours. Next time, we're going to hear from Ryan Ganey and David Bowden about their different experiences growing up in their blended families. I wasn't ignoring my dad because I didn't want him in my life. I wasn't hating my dad because I hated him. I wasn't trying to coach my dad because I wanted to be his coach, right? I, all of these are different ploys to try to fix something that I wanted fixed. And so it all pointed to a deeper root issue, which was I just wanted my dad back in the house. And I wanted my mom to stop crying. That's Ryan Ganey and David Bowden next time on Family Life Blended. I'm Ron Deal. Thanks for listening. And thanks to our Family Life Legacy partners for making this podcast possible. Our chief audio engineer is Keith Lynch, Bruce Golf, producer, our mastering engineer, Justin Adams, and theme music provided by Braden Deal. Family Life Blended is produced by Family Life and is part of the Family Life Podcast Network.